Standing in the city of Gyumri, Armenia, is the 102nd Russian military base. Over the years, the base has been at the center of multiple harrowing incidents. This video is not for the faint of heart. On April 14th, 1999, Two Russian soldiers, Private Denis Popov and Corporal Alexander Kamenev, stationed in the 102nd base in Gyumri, left the base without permission and ventured into town. They arrived at a cafe and ordered some cake and two bottles of vodka. Upon leaving the cafe, they drunkenly attempted to gain access to a house located on Giovanni Street, but were reprimanded by the residents. The soldiers, in response, cursed the residents for 10 minutes, then left the scene. Upon returning to the army base, the two soldiers grabbed AK-74 rifles, munitions, and returned to Gyumri. For almost one hour, the two soldiers indiscriminately fired their weapons at anybody who would come across their paths. As a result, two men were killed, 14 others were injured. Thankfully, vendors at a local produce market were able to disarm the soldiers and escorted them to the local police station. Kamenev was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He completed 11 years before being transferred to Russia. Popov was sentenced to 14 years in prison, of which he served just two years, then was transferred to Russia, where he was set free. The transfer documents were destroyed and their current whereabouts unknown. <laughs> On April 7, 2013, 10-year-old Arthur Magartichian from the village of Vaharamapert went to deliver a meal to his father, who was a shepherd. Accompanying him was his 15-year-old friend, Musher Gevorkian. The children were trekking through the pastures when suddenly there was an explosion after one of the boys hit a landmine. Both children were killed. The Russians of the 102nd base had authorization to use these pastures as a shooting range and they would usually deploy guards to oversee the area. However, this was a Sunday and nobody was on duty. The field was not fenced, nor did it have any warning signage. Both children's families, who were poor and couldn't afford their son's funerals, said they'd been intimidated by Russian authorities that if the case were to proceed, it would turn against them. Ultimately, the Russians successfully coerced the families of these boys to sign a document dropping their charges. Thus, the case is closed. The command of the Russian military base did not hold any person responsible and continued to ignore the complaints of the locals. Over the years, there have been many disturbing incidents around 102nd Russian base in Yumri, but neither of the two incidents I just recounted were the worst of it. This next one is... January 12, 2015. A Russian serviceman, Valery Permyakov, finishes his watch in post number two at one o'clock at night. He picked up an AK-74 rifle and a bayonet knife. Then he left the 102nd Russian military base at about two o'clock without permission. Around three o'clock, the base learns of his absence. Around six in the morning, Permyakov reached Myasinkian Street in Yumri and saw a house with the gates open. After entering the gate, Permyakov set his weapon to automatic fire, broke the door glass, and entered the house. The details of what happens next may be disturbing for some viewers. If you are of faint heart, please jump to the timestamp shown on the screen now. Inside the house, he saw a woman lying awake. She shouted something in Armenian and when she reached for her cell phone, he shot her. Then he moved to the next room where he shot two more people and then three more people in the next room. 
including a crying two-year-old. There was also a six-month-old baby in this room. But after he had fired 21 shots at six unarmed civilians, his weapon was jammed, so he used his bayonet knife to stab the baby. The infant was the only survivor at the scene, but would unfortunately succumb to his injuries days later. The massacre of the Avedisian family lasted about 15 minutes, after which Permyakov went to drink some tap water. Then he changed into civilian clothes, stole 5,000 Armenian drums, about $12, and two mobile phones. He left the house, leaving behind his military boots, uniform, and rifle. Permyakov chose to keep the knife to scare the dogs and the money necessary to return to Russia. What happens next is a bit of a mystery. According to the official version of events, the Russian Federal Security Service in Armenia reported that an unknown person approached the border guards on the Turkish border. The captain ordered him twice to stop, but the offender continued to move. The squad commander then fired a warning shot from an AK-74 rifle, forcing the suspect to lie face down on the ground. And so, Permyakov was detained some 16 kilometers away from Gyumri, near Bayandur, a village close to the Turkish border by Russian border guards. At least, that's the official version of events. Permyakov did fully admit his guilt during all the interrogations. But aside from that, there are a lot of contradictions between what he said when he was arrested and what he said later during his trial. In one statement, he said he left the base because he didn't want to serve anymore and wanted to return to Russia. In another, he said he just wanted to go for a walk and return to the base, which doesn't make any sense given the weapons he took with him. During the arrest, he said he had entered the Avedisian's house because he was thirsty and wanted to drink water. In the pre-trial testimony, he said he had entered the house to borrow money to return to Russia. In one statement, he said when he left the house he just went in a random direction with no intention of hiding. In another, he said he was aiming to reach the Armenia-Turkey border. In one statement, he said that he had phoned and ordered food on his way to the Armenia-Turkey border, and in another stated that no such thing had happened. The head of the Helsinki Citizens' Assembly, Vanatsor, alleges that Permyakov's testimony was being directed by Russian investigators. But why would the Russians want to meddle with the case? According to this report titled Russian Military Presence in Armenia, Moldova and Ukraine and its impact on human rights situation, there are numerous violations around this case. For instance, number one, they had to inform the Republic of Armenia. The commander of the 102nd base admitted they became aware that Permyakov had voluntarily left the base with a gun and ammunition at 3 a.m but didn't inform the Armenian side until hours later. That is, they didn't take sufficient measures to prevent the loss of lives. Number two, they had to hand him over to Armenian law enforcement agencies. Article five of the agreement on the Russian border guards in the Republic of Armenia stipulates that the Russian border guards must carry out law enforcement activities in accordance with Armenian criminal procedure legislation. This assumes that the persons arrested by the Russian border guards should have been transferred to Armenian authorities. However, they instead escorted him to the 102nd Russian military base and handed him over to the base commander. Number 3. Movement only upon consent. Article 25 of the same agreement states that the movement, training and maneuvers of the Russian border troops shall be carried out only upon consent by the Republic of Armenia. But according to a letter sent on the night of January 12, the Russian border guards did not have consent from the Armenian authorities to move from Bayandur to Gyumri when they transferred Permyakov. And number four, there was no attempt to cross the border. By far, the biggest discrepancies arise on where Permyakov was found and how he was arrested. As I mentioned earlier, the official story is that he was arrested while trying to cross the border. 
but the closest checkpoint to Bayander village where Russians would be stationed is up here in Akhurik. Why would Permyakov be down here in Bayandur? One theory is that he wasn't attempting to cross the border at all, which means he was detained on the territory of Armenia, where the Russian military, armed with machine guns, firing warning shots, were conducting operations. This introduces a slew of legal issues for the Russians, who, as we said, had no right to leave their base or posts without permission. Article 3 of the same agreement of the Russian border guards states that the Russian border troops will not be engaged in activities that do not protect the border. So Permyakov being arrested while trying to cross the border illegally would be extremely convenient for the Russians. However, according to Armenian law, attempting an illegal crossing of the state border is a crime, even if the crossing fails. However, no such border crossing charges were initiated by either Armenian or Russian law enforcement agencies, which may suggest that Permyakov never attempted to cross the border, and if there was no attempt to cross the border, it can be stated that the Russian border guards were engaged in activities not related to the protection of the border. Indeed, according to the Armenian NGO, Union of Informed Citizens, the Russian border guards did not detain Permyakov at all, but abducted him from the custody of Armenian officers. Somewhat relevant, this is the same organization that alleges Russians abused access to the Armenian border management information system at Sivartnots airport to arrest a dissident, which recently led to Armenia moving to expel Russian border guards from the airport. There have been many conspiracy theories spread in Armenia about the causes of the massacre. These range from Permyakov being the fall guy for a Russian government operation targeting the Avedisian family, to Permyakov being recruited by Azerbaijan, which some try to explain with his attempt to cross the border into Turkey. Personally, I don't buy that. I think Russians just like going to Turkey when the going gets rough, as we have seen with their immigration statistics since Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Plus, he was stationed very close to that border, so it would only make sense. I think he was probably trying to cross the border, possibly through these fields. Then, he was either detained by the Russian guards or by Armenian officers, and then handed over to the Russians without the proper due process. It does mean that the Russians violated Armenia's sovereignty in an effort to capture this monster, who, by the way, they never handed over to Armenia, and the discrepancies in Permyakov's statements could be explained by the Russians altering the details of this capture to cover up their violations. You see, there were already protests in Armenia demanding the removal of the base in response to the murders. And it wouldn't be a good look if the base, which was supposed to be protecting the borders, was not only murdering Armenian civilians, but also violating Armenian sovereignty. And to support this rather mundane theory, here's some karmic prophecy I found in this article from 2015. It says, quote, Various Russian officials had been darkly warning that the protests in Armenia represent an anti-Russian US-backed Maidan a la Ukraine. They advised President Serge Sarkisyan to take a harsher stance against the protesters. This shows that Moscow realizes it needs to assuage Armenian public opinion, which has been wounded not just by the Permyakov case, but also arms sales to Azerbaijan. Will this concession be enough to tamp down the anti-Russian sentiment on the streets of Yerevan? And the rest is history.